another episode of The Beards, The Beards, The Beards, The Beards. I'm going to have to start putting the audio file in there. That's just not cutting it anymore. <laughs> so, enthusiasm. you can see where it uh, constant a swagger on uh, this world famous uh, beach resort. We're in a cabana right here. Uh, my mom's over here. Um, we have an applaud sign, so she's going to be our live crowd. So Come let's on. go ahead and turn on that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Uh, so today we thought it would be fitting, uh, even though we're blocking out a lot of the sun right now, let's talk about sun. It's a really common thing to be confused about nowadays because there's a lot of conflicting ideas and opinions and actually a lot of conflicting research on both the negative and the positive of sun exposure as half the body or half of someone's body is getting cooked right now by the sun. Um, but what spurred me to bring this up was my... My ma, ma over here, ma, <laughs> was asking me about sunscreen, and we were talking, uh, the last podcast we were on, or we had Jeff Roberts on, and when we were at his lake house, we were talking about sunscreen, and different types of sunscreen. So, we're going to break it down. Break it down. Way down from the beginning of time. Now, we're not going to go back to the Big Bang when the sun was uh, the ice age. made, but we're going to talk about how humans evolved uh, and how we adapted to sun exposure and then how things have changed in modern culture and really uh, what is the the truth about the sun as far as uh, research would uh, shed light on it. No pun intended, really shed light. Um, as it pertains today. So basically, for the most part, if we're talking about uh, the evolutionary, again, remove beliefs um, from the, the explanation here, but we believe that humans evolved uh, or started evolution closer to the equator, right? So we we're an equatorial uh, hominid, and that means that, or we think that, that means that's why the uh, a darker pigmented skin was developed earlier because there was high sun exposure uh, without very much uh, basically I don't know, refuge from sun. Yeah. So in order for our body to be able to absorb the amount of sunlight we needed, but at the same time not create massive amounts of damage and oxidative stress and all the things we're going to talk about, uh, darker pigments became more prevalent pretty fast. Now, as, again, this is the thoughts based on the, the story of human evolution as we know it now. As humans started to migrate north and south away from the equator, that meant that at different latitudes we have different amounts of sun exposure, which should make sense. But as we get less sun exposure, we also usually have a decrease in temperature, which meant that we donned more clothes, which also is going to decrease sun exposure. So as we see that we decrease sun exposure, we saw lighter shades of skin show up further from equatorial hominids. And now we have varying degrees of sunlight that uh, basically people would need based on skin pigmentation, which is a very big deal and still plays out nowadays. Uh, We'll bring this up later as it pertains to uh, darker pigmented skins. We're actually seeing shifts in the amount of uh, things like melanoma in um, African American culture and things like that. And I'll, I'll bring up some ideas on why I think that's occurring. But another interesting point as we moved away from the equator, we also saw a rise in uh, including more fatty food sources in diets. And the reason that would be, and we'll, again, we'll go into this in depth, is that as our body had less sun exposure, both due to the latitudes we were living at, and then the, the amount of time that we spent covering ourselves both in shelter and with clothing, uh, inherently, our bodies knew that we needed more vitamin D, and a very good way to get vitamin D is from fatty food sources, in particular fatty fish, which is also probably not the easiest to get in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Think that's where that evolutionary kickoff started. I don't, th I don't think that's their main food source. Yeah, not a lot of shellfish, as far as I know. I don't really know what it is. My mom's going to Kenya, though, so maybe she can tell us when she goes over there. Let's see if you find a mollusk out on the <laughs> Sahara. Sure. Or, a swordfish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then let's fast forward big time. Uh, we don't know how much time, right? It's up in the air. We don't know how much time. It could be millions of years. It could be ten thousands. We don't know because nobody knows. I you were knows. referring to how much time we had today. No, um, we don't have millions of years, but no. we'll try to cover sun exposure in about an hour. <laughs> uh, so let's fast forward to the 1800s, and in, in particular, 1800s Europe and America. I thought this was an extremely interesting uh, stat 
that 90% of children had some manifestation of rickets in the 1800s in Europe and America. Because as we, you got to think of what the clothing was, right? We covered ourselves head to toe um, for the, you know, whatever the, the idea was of being proper and, you know, covering yourself in particular women. Um, so we grossly reduced our sun exposure. Um, Where did you know, have rickets? Um, my, my mom is saying that her sister had rickets. You moved um, to Michigan. Doesn't surprise me. No, I don't know why. It just doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um, and for people who don't know what rickets is, basically you have vitamin D deficiency. As you decrease the amount of vitamin D that you have, you basically get osteopenioporosis, but to a, a fast-acting degree to where you actually have almost like a chalky bone, and you'll see kids actually have the, the classic sign of rickets was a bowed leg or a bowed tibia because that weight-bearing bone couldn't take it, so it started to bow um, almost, like a, almost like a green stick fracture, but of a chronic nature. Um, so 1800s, we're seeing this, this moderate clothing uh, reduce the sun exposure, this high prevalence of rickets. Well, then all of a sudden, um, we had this, this rampant you know, vitamin D deficiency, and it wasn't just kids, it was total population. Did you explain how vitamin D is equivalent to why that's important with sun exposure? No, we're going through, okay, we're going we're going through the story okay. of sun, and then we're going to go into why it's bad, why it's good, and when we get into the good, we're going to talk about vitamin D. Okay. We're going to go through the whole process of vitamin D synthesis in the body. Right. I'll sit back it's and It's a good question, this. though. That's why you're here. But that's also why you're goose. Yeah, I'm Maverick. I don't know if you knew that. I'm the sidekick. You are about ready to put a helmet on and go for a motorcycle. Yeah, my very first one. Maybe we should write goose on it. Um, anyways. So we saw this, this massive shift of vitamin D deficiency. So, of course, the, the public health uh, initiative became, hey, we need to start getting in the sun more. We need to sunbathe. And this is about the time, if we move to about the early 1900s, it um, wasn't nationwide for Europe and America, but we started to see that the, the, bronze, the bronze color, you may probably my color, I'm not trying, probably the color of my skin, this bronze color. Uh, basically, a tan, a tan demeanor became uh, basically uh, known hand in hand for affluency, being able to vacation by the ocean, by the lake. Um, it became a sign of health. She's fine. This is, I don't know if you'll see Diva. She's a little greyhound here. She's not very fast anymore. Okay. She's out there getting her sun exposure. She's going in the yard. Um, but we started seeing physicians and just the general advice being go get in the sun and we like I said this bronze color became affiliated with health and wealth and uh, basically status. Well, well, was, it, was it JFK in the debate he, like when he was doing his debate in his political um, campaign he showed up and he was like completely bronze and looked really rejuvenated and healthy but his opponent was pretty pale and he wasn't sick or anything but everyone thought that he was sick just because he was next to Trump. Okay, probably. anyways. He probably does be Maryland. Nixon. Yeah. Oh, he's next. Yeah. Nixon. He was uh, all sweaty and pale. Yeah, yeah. And, and everyone thought I'm he must have been. I'm saying that Nixon looked all sweaty and pale next to him. Well, he, he could have. They thought people, people thought he was unfit to be president because yeah. he looked unhealthy compared Which is somewhat to... funny because now we have a orange president, right? He's taken a whole new color palette, <laughs> and now we're all confused because we don't know is he pale exactly. and unhealthy or is he bronze and healthy or is orange this new... It's like a warning flag at the beach. <laughs> Agent Orange. Right? We don't know what it means, but we know it's probably not good. Yeah. Okay. Um, focus. Anyways, so this bronze color became known as a status symbol. Um, my quick ADHD thought on this was it's kind of interesting that we went from cover yourself up to, oh, we need some light, and now we're back to this, like, Hey, we know we need sun, but not enough. But you're seeing all these products come out, like infrared saunas, juve lights, uh, all the different light uh, therapies. It's just we're always trying to figure stuff out. And Sloan said this yesterday as we were talking about something, that it always comes down usually to the most simplistic uh, answer, the most simplistic like tactic. And, like again, get out in the sun, just not too much, not too little. Right? I mean, that's what this is show. Like, you could stop listening now. Please don't. But you could. <laughs> Because that's basically what it breaks down to is like you need a little bit, but not too much. Um, but as we saw that people started being prescribed more sun exposure, just like 
good old American culture, we do too much of anything. So then we start to see a skyrocketing amount of skin cancer uh, show up, and not always melanoma, just swain of sale, cell, sale, sale, swain of sale, and basal cell. Take the boy out of Alabama. <laughs> Um, you only get squamous sale in Kentucky and Alabama. Everywhere else it's squamous sale. Uh, <laughs> but you used to see, or we saw the skyrocket and prevalence of all these things, and now it's come probably early 80s. I didn't look up the exact year. This is when you saw massive amounts of uh, sunscreen. And then I think, what was it called? I looked up one article. I'm, I'm going to link to a lot of articles today in the show notes. The initiative in Australia, I believe in the late 70s, was called Slip Slap Slop or something. It was slip, out a, slip on a hat, slap on some sunscreen, and slop on, I don't know. I feel like that could very easily be a campaign for a different yeah, activity. Yeah, I don't than know what it was. Playing but at the beach. Of course, the Aussies, you know, <laughs> slip, slap, slop, right? I don't know. Something like that. You'll see it in the article. But we saw this big education piece come out on sunscreen, and of course, you know, they would hand out free sunscreen at, you know, if you go to amusement parks and at schools and everybody, you put on your sunscreen, we get so weirded out. And of course, we see like zinc oxide on the lifeguard's nose around this time. And, and then as we go further down this, we're going to talk about some of these things that are popular nowadays that may not be uh, quite what we think they are. So that's kind of the history of the sun, besides the hundreds of millions and billions of years. When the, the star came about. Been around. Yeah. But we're not that good of friends. So I don't know him that well, so I'm not going to really talk about him that much. Um, He's anyways. got jokes. Uh, so first thing we need to tackle is why has sun exposure been demonized so much? Uh, so oh, I'm going to talk about the lifestyle shifts that I think have taken, that have taken place that have led to this. Uh, we know that the sun isn't inherently bad. It's the source of life on Earth. You would not have yeah. any life without the sun. Um, so that's the first thing we need to realize. But as our lifestyle has shifted, uh, dietary changes, uh, amount of activity, uh, different diseases, we're seeing that we're not able to adapt to the amount of sun exposure that we need in a, in a readily fashion, right? Because we spend so much time indoors when we go outdoor, we usually cook get sunburned right away, which we know isn't the greatest thing for you, but most people would think, I don't think this is true, that they don't have enough time to go out and get adequate amounts of sun every day, which we're not saying that you have to strip nude like some of these biohacking uh, gurus, but you need to go out, you know, it could be a walk, it could be, you know, whatever it is, but uh, we'll go ahead and say this, it's around 15 to 20 minutes a day of direct sun exposure. Um, they actually suggest to stay out of the high times for sunlight, which would be basically from 11 to 3 p.m. So it's outside of those realms, so you're not getting direct uh, exposure. But at the end of the day, I'm not a huge fan of these like hard fast rules of like, oh, I'm gonna set my watch, 20 minutes, perfect, right? Like, there's probably something to be said uh, about enjoying yourself in the sun and not just like going out for using it as a supplement. The sun isn't a supplement, right? It's not. Oh, I gotta get my sun today. I well, it may be. Today. It may be a good place to start. Right, if you're not getting routine. any. Yeah. Um, if you're not getting any, I don't. we're probably not going to be friends because we're probably going to live in your mom's basement. I know plenty of people that don't get any sun and that you would be friends with them. Do they live in the basement? Maybe a few. I don't know. You'll have to introduce me to them. Alright, so the World Health Organization, this is another interesting stat. The WHO, this came out, I think, 2006. So even though all of this, uh, the demonization of sun exposure came about and skin cancer, cover yourself up, put on your sunscreen, in 2006, I know that's a dated stat, but only 0.1% of basically what we would call a DALY, so that's basically like your disability, what is it? it's basically the years that you would live with disease um, beyond the, the actual disease occurring, right? So if I get skin cancer, Right now, how much my life is affected? Only 0.1% of that is directly correlated with like sun exposure. So we have all of these things saying, "Oh, melanoma," you know, and melanoma is bad. I mean, that's a metastatic cancer that can devastate people. But 0.1% is coming down to most people that are even having melanoma, basal cell, squamous cell, uh, you know, anything else to do with sun. It's not really affecting them for long term. Even if they have melanoma, they're usually getting over. It's not turning into this metastatic well, death sentence. That's, thank God for our medical advancement. Right. 
which we've had a, a personal we have two right now. Yeah, that are dealing with this, and it seems like it's being taken care of. Yeah, advances in medicine help, but again, we would like to be preemptive or preventative with this stuff and do stuff right from the beginning rather than have mm -hmm. to deal with ramifications right. later. So I will also point out, like, it's up in the air. It's it's questionable the direct correlation between sun exposure and melanoma. Melanoma usually pops up in places that it isn't being exposed to sun, like on the back or, you know. Well, and let's, and let's talk about this. So that's a, it's a good point because we usually correlate and maybe we'll get a local dermatologist on to talk about this here pretty soon. But we usually correlate like a freckle or some sort of oxidative damage on the skin for the spot where we're having melanoma. What we need to realize is just because that piece of your skin is what gets exposed does not mean that's where cancer has to show up. Your skin is one big organ. That's true. So just because it's in a spot where I don't have that, there could be all sorts of postulations, but when we get into the dietary like shifts that have happened in humans and lifestyle modifications and they explain why we're having so much damage done to something that's actually pretty beneficial. Yeah. Well, your skin is your largest organ. Yeah. Um, so let's explain what, how we actually get uh, sun into our body and what's happening. So UVA radiation is what makes up 95 to 97% of the spectrum of light that's coming from the sun, uh, or the overall UV radiation. Now the UVA is actually what you want, right? That's UVA is not necessarily, it's not, nothing's good or bad. It's just the thing that actually uh, has most of the positive benefits as far as chemical processes happening in your skin, the, all the things we're gonna talk about uh, from a neurochemical standpoint. Now the thing that is the most damaging is UVB. And if you look on things like sunscreen, right, we'll see your SPF or your, your broad spectrum. So let's explain what broad spectrum means. That means it's blocking everything, right? It's not UVB specific, it's not UVA specific. It's blocking everything, which that's a, and this says right here, this is, I don't care who, copper tone, kid spray, this is SPF 50. It says continuous spray is specifically developed for active kids. The broad spectrum UVA slash UVB protection provides quick, even coverage. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about some of the chemicals and things that are in these. But the uh, thing to understand is we're blocking the entire spectrum of sun, or trying to, at least. And we'll bring up a stat on uh, some of this here pretty quick. But the UVA is what we need, right? So there was such a massive shift in cover yourself up, put your sunscreen on, and we actually started to see more <laughs> vitamin D deficiency, right? And it's running rampant. That's one of the most common deficiencies out there right now. So now people are moving to, oh, I need to get direct sunlight. Well, we should be a little bit smarter on what we're putting on ourselves in the first place so we still get the good and not the bad, which is kind of interesting. Because if you went into a uh, tanning bed, those are non-UVB based lights. So it's just the UVA for most tanning beds. So we're trying to not get a full spectrum there, which I think there's inherently problems with that, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so sunburn is caused by too much UVB. And the way that damage is caused is you're actually creating free radicals. And a free radical is basically either what a hydroxyl or a peroxyl group. Right, so hydrogen peroxide is one of your biggest free radicals that's actually forming your body. I know we think of hydrogen peroxide as something that you put on a cut, it disinfects <laughs> it, which, interesting enough, the bubbles on the hydrogen peroxide when they touch skin, that's not disinfecting anything. That's a chemical reaction that's occurring. It's, it's not just, disinfecting it's anything. It's fun to watch. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's oxidative reaction, right? It's nothing's occurring there to kill anything. Um, DNA damage. So free radicals are what let's just say talk to your DNA and basically tell your DNA how to react. So if your DNA is saying, man, there's damage being done, the chances of replicating, I don't know if faulty is the right term, but basically where you create errors in your DNA, enough errors in your DNA lead to things like cancer. Um, it directly damages collagen fibers, also known as wrinkles. Right? I think we all know that, but you have to realize when you get too much UVB, you're actually making your collagen less elastic, right? And that's what's creating that wrinkle. That's why our wrinkle stays. Uh, destruction of vitamin A occurs. So vitamin A is crucial for many processes in our body. Um, and we usually correlate vitamin A to eye health, but vitamin A is crucial to kidney health, skin health, um, everything.
when you are in the sun for too long, in particular in contact with UVB, you directly destroy vitamin A that is basically living in the uh, liquid bilayer in your, your dermis, not your epidermis. And then one that most people are familiar with, which is why you see, uh, you know, a lot of these, we were, where were we going in? We saw a woman with big blue blockers on. The casino. <laughs> yeah. Just, what is it? Why? Like, do, do they send those to you when you get a certain age? I don't know where you blue get blockers. Where you, where I don't think anybody does because they send them. Somebody, AARP, sent them to you <laughs> yeah. with your card. But basically, um, if you have too much sun exposure over time, there's a, a correlation. I don't know if there's a causative notion there. Maybe there is, and I just don't know, to cataract formation. And we're going to talk about eyes specifically and sunglasses use as we go through this. But that's basically the, the breakdown of the bad portion of the spectrum and the bad things that can happen, right? So we know how we get a sunburn, too much UVB. Um, we know that we create free radicals, have DNA damage, can lead to cancer, right? And we talked about the most common forms of cancer with the worst one being melanoma. Um, and for people, we said it once, but for people who don't know this, melanoma is so bad because it is highly metastatic. Metastatic means that it moves from organ system to organ system. And the fastest or the most common place for melanoma to move to is? Brain. Well, Spine. brain and skeletal system. Spine, yeah. yeah. And then lung would be third. Um, I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. Yeah. Or we're back in, back in class. school. Yeah. Yeah. So then, I mentioned this earlier, there's actually an increased prevalence now of melanoma in people of color. And I think why this is occurring, because uh, if I have black skin, it is hard, it's harder for me to get sunburned, right? Um, but I think why this is occurring is dietary shifts. And we're going to get into this here pretty quick, but when I have decreased uh, amounts of good lipids in my system, and I... What's uh, a lipid, though? Uh, fat. There we go. Right? So when I have decreased amounts of good fat, I have decreased amounts of vitamin A, right? So I shoot through whatever's left pretty quick, or I have decreased amounts of vitamin D, which we're going to talk about here in depth, that means that my oxidative damage is going to be that much quicker, and I think that's what you're going to see happening. The interesting note on that is, if I have a decreased amount of good fats, and I have an increased amount of bad fats, which we call it a bad fat, it's not inherently bad, um, there's essential fats that are omega-6s, when I have a profile where I have more omega-6 and a more omega-3, we actually see even more free radical damage. Just having uh, a ratio of more omega-6 to omega-3 causes more free radical damage just on its own without sun exposure. So then that, that catalytic reaction of sun exposure speeds it up. Um, so let's get into sunscreen. This is an interesting stat that, again, multiple research articles coming up. 75% of sunscreens out there do not block the amount of UVA rays that it says it does. So even though you're getting this SPF 50, right, um, that does not mean that you're blocking what it says, which when we say, hey, this is for kids, I want to make sure my kid's safe, which we don't know if that's safe yet or not, it's interesting that 75% of these are basically not even doing what they're advertised for. Um, this even says, number one pediatrician recommended brand, um, except when your kid gets fried like a piece of bacon. Um, the other thing about sunscreens that's uh, very, very important to understand is what else is in the sunscreen besides the sunscreen. And this has been looked at for a very, very long time. Um, I'm pretty sure that most people at this point in time know that things that are in your, your beauty products, your shampoo, your soaps, like parabens and uh, like sulfates are going to have deleterious or negative effects on your skin. Uh, those are in not so much the spray, but your rub-on lotions are definitely going to have parabens. Parabens are basically an emulsifier that make it easier for that thing to be absorbed in your skin. So I'll tell you a quick side note. <laughs> we got all-natural sunscreen from Whole Foods. Eric paraben-free. So you put this stuff on and it's like you're putting paste on. And I mean, it you won't get any, I had streaks where the sunscreen was and I had not rubbed it in elsewhere. Yeah. So you you give up the convenience factor for the paraben free, so it's just your choice. Um, but that's just a side it's note. Like clay paste. Yeah, it works. And um, it was white. <laughs> the other thing about uh, sunscreens, a couple things, is the, the most top or uh, toxic component that's been shown time and time again in research is this oxybenzone. And that is, in particular, always going to be in a spray. Um, that's been correlated, not caused, but correlated to a lot of uh, 
skin cancer prevalence. The other things that are in here are things like fragrances. Um, usually fragrances are uh, artificially derived, so they're, they're a chemical. Again, you're putting a chemical on your skin. When your skin is in the sun, uh, things are far more easily absorbed, and they're put right into the bloodstream via your skin, so it's just going to get in there faster. And believe it or not, one thing that's been shown toxic, and I know this seems like uh, kind of a conundrum after I just said that vitamin A is decreased, Vitamin A is, can be toxic in the form that they put it in here. And I was looking at this one earlier, and it does have, well, this has vitamin E in it, which is probably um, part of the oil base of this. But this has a, a retinol or a retinyl uh, form of vitamin A. When you put, like you said, sun destroys vitamin A. So I don't know the thought process. I'm not a manufacturer of this. Uh, vitamin A is going to help this be absorbed into your skin. But what do we say? is vitamin A is destroyed, it's going to lead to more oxidative damage. The form of vitamin A that they're putting in is artificially derived, and there's probably a, a, a mimicry effect occurring where your body's like, ooh, it looks like vitamin A, and it's not. So then you're, you're having this response without any protective nature of vitamin A occurring. Well, I have a study that was done, pulled up here in front of me, and they say over 40% of sunscreens that are on counters at stores contain a synthesized or form of vitamin A. And that vitamin A, when it's applied on the skin like that, um, increases chance of skin tumors and skin cancer. <laughs> so it just seems so counteractive. Um, well, and it's probably the fact that it's that artificial form. Right. Right. And, I mean, that goes for a lot of different stuff. We're going to talk about vitamin D and the formations and everything. I also wanted to, are you going to touch on the oxybenzones anymore? Um, you got more hit it. It's a very big endocrine disruptor. So... <clears throat> endocrine is like our hormone system and so oxybenzones disrupt your ability to regulate hormones so it's estrogen estro estrogenic in nature so you absorb like up to nine percent of it or something through your skin and so in men that's going to decrease sperm counts that's in women that's going to increase chances of things like endometriosis and pcos um so kids it could be early onset puberty yeah i mean Man boobs. That's man boobs. I got it. I got it. I I feel more for the endometriosis topic. Do you so feel for the, the move topic? Yeah. <laughs> so let's just take a pause and let's take a little walk out to the beach in our minds. Mm -hmm. So let's go on a family fun We have kids with adventure. us. So maybe I, I stop by Walmart and I get my, my number one pediatrician recommended uh, Coppertone Copper Kids Sport. which was shown to have one of the highest rates of right. oxybenzone. I get my... Uh, I don't know what's their Walmart brand bottled water, yep. plastic bottles, right? and then I get some, some fantastic food from Walmart. And we go out to the beach. I lather myself and my kids up in this, and then I let my bottles of water sit in my car for a little while, and then I sit them in the sun for a little while. And then as the kids come back in, and they're, this wasn't blocking everything it said it was, and it probably didn't last 80 minutes, and they're just getting... Uh, burnt to little melanoma crisps and then they come in and drink their estrogen tea right so mm -hmm. um what we're saying with the water is there are a lot of xenoestrogens that are leached out of plastics in particular with cheap uh very thin plastics i know i'm drinking very water thin. out of a uh, plastic water bottle here but when you have that thin uh plastic it's basically it's breaking down in the water and the hotter it gets the faster that reaction happens so if we're talking about hormonal disruptors and xenoestrogens, like heat exposure is always going to catalyze things. I mean, that's one of your biggest catalysts in a laboratory. So just take this into account. There are choices to be made on what you're going to put on your kids, if you put anything, what you're drinking out of. All of this goes into effect. So you can take that family fun day in the sun and remove, you know, and we're not trying to be this crazy anti-cancer or you got to protect everything, but it's just be smart, right? Oh. Um since the 80s, male sperm counts have decreased drastically. The increase of uh, infertility and endometriosis in women is increasing it's drastically. When do we know all of these estrogenic, mimicking chemicals and, uh, I mean, compounds are in the water system now and everything. And I mean, it's, it's hard not to have exposure to this stuff, so reduce your exposure where you can. Where you can. I, you're not going to run away from it at this point in time. I mean, it's just like the antibiotic load in the water system. And we're bringing on, in a couple weeks, uh, Justin Overton, who's the director of Coos River Keeper, to talk about all this stuff in depth. And a killer yogi. Yeah, we're going to talk about some yoga. Do some yoga first. Okay, 
So we've, I don't know how many times we've said vitamin D. Vitamin D. Already. Oh, are, are we on vitamin D yet? On vitamin D. We're going to touch on vitamin D. Make sure to play drinking game. Vitamin drink. Right? That's what D stands for. Drink my protein shake. Um, so vitamin D. There are just some interesting facts about vitamin D first. Over a thousand genes directly regulated by vitamin D. Vitamin D has been relabeled a pro, pro hormone, which basically means that it is the thing that comes before a hormonal um, change or shift or formation. Some people label it a hormone. Um, it's still kind of up in the air. It's really not labeled a vitamin anymore. It's a pro hormone. Um, and it's a sterile based uh, hormone or vitamin, which basically means it's fat soluble, uh, which is crucial to understand both on how you would take it, but also as it pertains to how it's going to be formed in your skin. As we said, uh, with increasing prevalence of skin cancer and people of color, the reduced amount of good fats, aka lipid or cholesterol, will directly affect how that sun exposure is going to affect you. So, I think most people know that vitamin D, is, there's something that happens when you get in the sun and you have vitamin D that forms your body. I don't think most people know, most people probably don't even care. Basically, it's no different than a photosynthesis reaction um, between chlorophyll and the sun in a plant. Chlorophyll? More like chlorophyll. Um, but photosynthesis reaction is actually via UVB, <laughs> which is interesting, right? It's not UVA. So the good thing for most of this stuff, which we're going to talk about what UVA does in particular, but the thing that would burn you, just think UV burn, right? is the thing that catalyzes the reaction to form vitamin D in your body. This is why when we mess with the spectrum, and we're going to talk about sunglasses and windshields and things like that, to block out UVB, we're really screwing the pooch here. And that's what people went to because, again, we think we're smart and we try to reduce things down into parts. And just like whatever it is, you can't reduce, distill, and then synthesize um, something there's always, you're always going to pay the price, and it usually takes time to figure that out like this. So here's the specifics. Uh, when you have a reaction in your skin, and we're not going to go into crazy detail, in detail like Dizier. Dizier. Sorry, our nephew <laughs> says Dizier, like he's from uh, Uncle, France, so it's Dizier. Uncle Bo, can I have some Dizier? <laughs> uh, basically, when you have that reaction between your skin and your UVB, D3 is formed. And... When D3 is formed, that basically moves to your liver, and in your liver, that is basically transformed into 25 hydroxy vitamin D. This is what they test for when they test for vitamin D. Right? This is they're looking for blood serum levels of 25 OHD. Um, so the other thing that is occurring at the same time in other areas of your body is that same D3 from your skin is going to areas like your kidney and being transformed into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Now this is a less bioavailable form, but it's still sold as supplementation sometimes, which is interesting, and that would be D2. Now, D2, for whatever reason, has been uh, the most common high dose therapy form of vitamin D in clinical settings for years, but all the research points to D3 being the most bioavailable, which is what forms your skin, so it should make sense. Uh, but basically, we have to realize that D, vitamin D is made in multiple places, but it's really the biggest one is between skin to liver. And what do we also know about your liver? That's where most of your sterols, your cholesterols, are processed. Um, and then basically, whether it's going to be turned into glycogen or fat stores or just held as cholesterol, um, so a healthy liver, healthy skin, uh, two of your biggest organs. Skin first, liver second, correct? Well, rest. Eh, depends on what you Surface see. Surface area, yeah. Now, interstitium, fascia, yeah. they're all organs. Yeah. Uh, I'd say your liver is a pretty stinking important one. Yeah, from a reaction standpoint. Now, the 120, 125 OHD or dihydroxy vitamin D is what you have to have in your system, though, to help with calcium and phosphorus absorption. This is why D2 became popular. Is we saw in the research or from physiology the direct connection. We said, man, if we have osteopenia, osteoporosis, we have some sort of uh, bone degradation, let's give them what they need to help absorb calcium and phosphorus back into the skeletal system. Well, that's not how it works. Because when you take, in particular orally, even inter intravenously, D2, you cannot catalyze that reaction as it's supposed to be. So that stuff basically is, for the most part, unusable. That's what bioavailable means. How well can your body use it when you take it? 
That's why you actually need D3 in your body to make the, the conversion. Now, some people can't make that conversion, right? Um, for a long time, uh, I thought I was one of those people, and behold, it wasn't. There were some other things happening here. That's why nutrition does get somewhat confusing. So at the end of the day, we know that most people are vitamin D deficient, right? And we know we need vitamin D, so your first choice should be sun, because that's how it's going to happen the best. Now, if I get in the sun, what do I need to make sure I have? We're going to talk about this in depth. I need to make sure I have those essential fatty acids, um, vitamin A, right? Uh, something that's kind of called vitamin A. If I don't have these things in my system, I could be getting more damage on my skin, but I also may not be making vitamin D, which is the reason I went out in the sun in the first place. So supplementation is not a bad thing. It should be used as a supplement, which means that it's secondary to the primary source. It's a supplement to that. Um, so when we look at why vitamin D is so important besides bone health, which is the number one, it's also hugely important for neurologic health, right? How your nerves function is going to be based off of how you regulate, regulate calcium and phosphorus because at the basically the neuronal or the synapse, the, um, the junction of a nerve to another nerve, uh, that's going to be based on basically the calcium channel. And if your calcium levels are out of or dysregulated, there's going to be issues there. That's why there's a big correlation between vitamin D and things like multiple sclerosis, uh, diabetes. There's a huge correlate between, which again, I'm saying correlate. Don't think cause. There, there could be just a huge correlation of everybody's vitamin D deficient. There's a ton of people that have diabetes. That's where we have to dig into it further. Um, but there are these mass, you know, MS is being diagnosed more and more and more. Um, so people are looking at, well, the things that we're grossly deficient in, like uh, vitamin D, magnesium, what role are these playing in these systemic diseases? And uh, MS is being almost recategorized as autoimmune, mm -hmm. which it is autoimmune. And you're creating basically Plaking. cortical placking, and we don't know why the placking is occurring. Um, so what is the amount of vitamin D that we need daily? It's around 4,000 to 6,000 IUs daily. And that's if we said we were taking it, that's an international unit, and that's like our supplement load. This was wrong for years. And the funny thing is, this was a more or less like a, a clerical error in writing down what the research actually said. So for years, the, the clinical recommendation was 600 IUs per day. Lo and behold, it was 6,000. They wrote it down wrong in the chart on the research. And this is just what perpetuated the system forever. Way to go, clerk. And then, I think this was just a couple years ago, they went back <laughs> into the research and like, oh no, it was 6,000. So now we've upped the dose, which most people are doing mega doses of vitamin D for people that were very deficient, right? It was around 10,000 IV. Yeah, I think, I think we think most because that's the population we're around. Yeah. I doubt that that's most happy. You know, I, I don't think that's the majority of the population. And I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching have had vitamin D levels tested. So serum level uh, vitamin D, they're looking at a range between 30 to 100 usually. Um, if you're below 30, you're definitely deficient. Now the debate is coming, how much vitamin D is not just non-pathologic, right? We know we need it above 30, but how much is good and then how much is too good, mm -hmm. right? Where it's actually deleterious again, or that would what I would call the American load, right? We just do too much because we know yeah. it's good. So there's a lot of wellness practitioners and functional medicine practitioners that want to see people's levels above 50 to 60. Um, I would say most people are pretty good around 45 to 50, just in general. Um, you do not want to push it too high because if you have too much vitamin D in your system, you're going to start to create things like hypercalcinosis where you're laying down more calcium in soft tissues, in the uh, basically endothelial walls in your arteries and veins. In particular, if you don't have a little thing called vitamin K with your vitamin D supplementation. Right? And you need vitamin K, which again is a fat-soluble vitamin that is formed in your lower GI tract, which many people are deficient in because their lower GI tract is trash. But if you don't have vitamin K, and I'm saying this to everybody, but in particular my women that are taking calcium supplementation, if you don't have K with your D, that means that, I know we're throwing out, I feel like the letter monster here, if you don't have K with your D, letter monster. <laughs> if you don't have vitamin K, you're not going to absorb your vitamin D which means that all that calcium you're taking is being deposited all elsewhere. All that CA. Yeah, all that CA is being deposited in your K-I-N-D-E-Y-S. Is that kidneys? Did I spell this wrong? Not necessarily. <laughs> Other, 
like we had a patient the other day that was diagnosed with calcific tendonitis. Basically, yeah. her both tendons, even though it's her left shoulder bugging her, was having uh, calcium changes in it. Which there is a, a disease called hydroxyapatite deposition disorder, where you're laying down hydroxyapatite, which is not calcium. It's a more brittle form of a. Uh, it is a cal It's a phosphorus-based. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Mineral complex. Mineral, yeah. Uh, but basically Mineral you're laying this down in your tendon due to stress load. Well, she had been taking calcium in E2 for years because she was diagnosed as osteopenic and then it had gotten worse. It got better for a little bit and then it got worse and moved into osteoporosis. So we had this whole discussion with her. That's why I'm going into depth even though we're talking about sun. Um, so I think we have we beat vitamin D to death. I think so. Yeah. I think. Do you have any questions well, about vitamin D? No, mine's good right now. Yeah. It's good. I'll tell you my story. My I still had bad osteoporosis. But yeah. My vitamin D for about two years was like 25. And we were, I mean, I was working with our functional medicine doctor, and no matter what I did, it wasn't working. Well, the big shift that I did was started upping my magnesium load. And then as, so my liver enzymes were a little elevated too, which I think is a bit of a familial thing. So I think it's benign in nature. But what do we say? If your liver isn't working, it doesn't matter how much vitamin D you're taking. So we did some mega doses with some real high quality uh, liquid vitamin D3 plus K. And when I went in this last time, it was up to 35. So it was back above that five level norm. I'm going to push up in that 45, 50 realm. And, you know, so it can't, it took us a while to figure out why. And we thought there for a while I was one of those people that was a non converter where I wasn't taking D3 into. Sorry, that 25 OHD into that 125 OHD, but that's not the case. Um, so, just an interesting side note there. So, let's talk about these things that you need in your body to be able to make sure that sunlight is going to be a beneficial thing for you. So, when we say good fats, what does that mean? Uh, again, not common knowledge, but being talked about more. We know that we need a around a three to one ratio of omega threes to omega sixes in our diet. Omega-3s, again, are going to come from things in particular like fish, fatty fish. That's why fish oil supplementation has become very big. Um, even things like coconut oil, MCT oil, those are omega-3. Avocados, nuts. Some nuts are omega-6 rich. Right? Some are not. Macadamia nuts, more omega-3. You get into Brazil nuts, walnuts, that's higher. Wal walnuts, omega-3. Brazil nuts, in particular, things like peanuts and those things, that's going to be higher omega-6. Um, what else? Fatty cuts of meat. I mean, any of your cholesterol-based stuff is going to help that load. One of the things that you definitely get from uh, things like uh, a walnut is something called linoleic acid, and that is what is called vitamin F nowadays. And that's an essential fatty acid, so essential means it's something that you don't make that you have to get from your diet. It's essential. Um, now, that is, in, that is an omega-6 fatty acid, right? So we don't want a ton of that, but if you don't have that, that has been shown to decrease the conversion of sunlight to vitamin D and the usable forms of vitamin D in your body. So that's a pretty crucial one. Would I suggest supplementing with that alone? No. An essential fatty acid, there are multiple, just like uh, essential amino acids. Like We need these things, but when we, again, just like the sunlight, we don't want to break down the spectrum. We want the entire thing. So get them from whole food sources. Try not to supplement on something like that. Um, what else do we need? We talked about vitamin D. We talked about... Uh, fatty acids, anything else you can think about? Yeah, so that's kind of it. Um, but there's, if you look at a lot of supplement companies now, they're selling supplements that are based on this, uh, uh, like standard process had a, has a cataplex F, right? It stands for vitamin F. It's basically this essential fatty acid with some other components. I don't think we need these supplements. I think we should be getting this from our diet, the mm -hmm. fat component. Now, do a lot of people supplement with fish oil? Yeah, that's an omega-3. The reason being, it's very hard in our society to get omega-3s out of fish sources because farm-raised fish has been shown to yeah. have more omega-6 than omega-3 when it's farm-raised, usually because of what they're fed. They're usually fed grain, right? So that grain is a higher omega-6. Um, things to stay away from. I know that we're not diving into a whole diet thing here, but in particular, vegetable oil. Vegetable oil Vegetable oil-based products are things cooked in vegetable oil. Very high uh, omega-6 load. Very, uh, 
can cause a lot of oxidative damage on their own. And we know that sunlight exposure causes oxidative damage, which to some extent is good, but not great to get too much. So let's not add more of that into our diet. Hey, well, this came up yesterday. Um, if we were going to kick out vegetable oil, what could we sub in instead of that? So, like instead of the canola oil in the pantry yeah. or the vegetable oil? So it depends on what we're cooking, how we're cooking it, and what temperature we're cooking at. The general guidelines, olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil. Um, you have your your flash points, like your temperatures on all of these, and they're different for all. Um, a lot of people, you know, come to us, oh, you're not supposed to cook with olive oil at all. No, if you're, if it's low temperature, right, over a longer time, olive oil is just fine. It's actually pretty good. When you get into higher heat stuff, that's where you have to get something like avocado oil because it has a higher flash point where it basically doesn't, it doesn't go rancid under that amount of temperature. Yeah. And then coconut oil somewhere in between. Things like fish do really well in coconut yeah. oil if you're pan frying your skin. You also brought up some good grass fed butter yesterday yeah. as well. Butter, I mean, fantastic. I mean, I probably use too much butter. Do you mean country country crop margarine? Oh yeah. Um, because what is what is the number one ingredient? Oh, it's oh, it's vegetable oil, isn't it? Or canola oil. Canola oil. Yeah. <laughs> or so soybean or whatever. Yeah. Um. And there's other things that are very high in omega six is flaxseed, or not flaxseed, sorry, um, like grapeseed oil, grapeseed oil, there's two different things. Um, what else? You said canola oil, peanut oil, cottonseed oil, all these things high, Soybean high, oil. yeah, omega six load. And a lot of your things in like fast food restaurants are uh, fried in these things, and then when you fry it, it's actually absorbed a lot of that kind of fat into it, so it's not the greatest things. Well, I, I know we could we could correlate so many different reasons why we started seeing spikes in skin cancer, why we started seeing spikes in use of sunscreen and whatnot, but we said it was around, what, the early 80s? And when did we start demonizing fat? And when did we start yeah. cutting fat out of everything that yeah. we ate? When that's what I was saying about the, probably the increased prevalence in people of color, I think we grossly decreased the amount of good fats. Um, yeah. Well, you can also, the darker the skin tone, the more melanin, the harder it is actually for, for you to, get, to adequate, yeah. get adequate sunlight and to get adequate vitamin D. So if you're not getting those fatty sources, you're you're Working against really hindered. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about how do we go about doing this? How do we get good stuff? Well, first of all, we need to realize some of the things that we're using every day and how they can hinder our health. So let's talk about shades for a second. Are you going to put these on so yeah, let's put, let's put these bad boys on. So interesting things. Uh, cheaper the sunglasses, probably the worst they do. You guys probably like the sunscreen. They don't do everything they're trying to be. They probably don't block a lot of the spectrum, which may not be the worst thing. Yeah. Right? Um, interesting note though, when you have direct uh, sun exposure to your eyes, a lot of things happen. Um, and you get release of growth hormone, right? Which is crucial for athletes or kids or really anybody. Recovery. But another thing is, when we have direct sunlight exposure, especially early in the morning, um, we release serotonin, right? So serotonin is one of our feel-good neurotransmitters. I thought it was oxytocin. Oxy actually, oxytocin is my favorite. Right? That's the hug. The, the hug. hug. Um, but when I have serotonin released early in the day, so when I have early sunlight exposure, which now, you know, when we talk about like sleep, hygiene, and things like that, we know that we're supposed to wake up in the sun. So I try to get in a dark room, but when I have early release of serotonin, I actually have a higher release of melatonin around nighttime later in the day, which is what we need to sleep. Um, when we see that people mess up their diurnal cycle or their circadian rhythm because we wake up in unnatural light or we're in unnatural light all day or in unnatural light way late into the night, we see the circadian rhythm get messed up, the pineal gland isn't regulating melatonin like it should, and then people start supplementing for things like melatonin. So, serotonin is derived from L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid. L-tryptophan is a correlate of what we would call 5-HTP or 5-hydroxytryptophan. 5-HTP is another very common supplement, right? And I know a lot of people think tryptophan, turkey, eh, whatever, it makes you <laughs> sleepy. So, Let's talk about this real quick. 5-HTP is what actually puts you to sleep, right? If you don't go to sleep, I will put you to sleep. What movie? I don't know. Not the old one. Ah, uh, yeah. disappointing. Sorry. Um, my fingers hurt. 
so serotonin, which is derived from L-tryptophan or 5-HTP, is then that precursor. So basically what we're saying is it kind of goes back to diet again. Right? If I don't have the essential amino acids that I need, one of those being L-tryptophan along with the other, what, 19? There's 20? Right? I'm going to be confusing. 20 years ago. I don't know. Sorry, we'll go back to nutrition. We need to. Um, if I don't have those in my diet, it really doesn't matter if I get the early sunlight exposure. So I'm not going to be able to make that conversion um, throughout the day. So again, we're, I know we're barking at you on nutrition here, but it's, it's everybody knows it's crucial. We've talked about it numerous times. Um, so sunglasses, when we say blue blockers, what's that blocking? UVB, right? That's those UVB is being blocked, which we know is damaging, but it's also necessary, right? When you don't have that full spectrum hitting your retina, you don't get that same release of serotonin and growth hormone, which is interesting. Same thing happens with windshields and cars, right? So uh, I was listening to a really interesting podcast. Um, I think it's Banyan Botanicals. It was the one who owns that. And this was on, I believe, the Align podcast with Aaron Alexander, if I'm remembering correctly. But she brought up the interesting note of we think of, uh, like, in particular, like semi truck drivers. It's very common for them to show up with melanoma on the arm that's always on the, the window side because we think of sun exposure. Well, she brought up the point that it's probably not the sun exposure. It's probably actually the sun exposure through a window or a pane of glass that's made to block spectrums of light to make it easier on our eyes to see what we're driving. The alteration in the spectrum deviates the reaction in our skin. You do that over years. Now I have probably different reactions occurring versus that, the better reaction. Uh, definitely that happens with windshields, not as much on the peripheral windows or your, your side windows. But again, that stuff affects you. So, what are, we, what are we finding out here? We know we need 15 to 20 minutes a day of direct sun exposure, right? Maybe we don't need this at all unless we know we're going to be out in the sun for a long time, and there would be better choices. When I say this, for people listening, I'm holding the sunscreen. Um, there would be better choices, things that don't contain oxybenzone, things that don't contain parabens, um, things that are all natural as best they can. Sometimes they're not the easiest from an emollient standpoint. Well, I was reading something um, earlier about how it's actually kind of impossible to have an all-natural yeah. sunscreen because uh, zinc oxide and um, oh, the minerals that are needed in the sunscreen, you can't break down small enough to make them in a sunscreen, so there has to be some sort of chemical process Which to is do zinc, that. I saw a research article where zinc oxide is still the number one. I mean, if you're looking for a, a non-toxic yeah. uh, form, but that's blocking everything yeah more or less. I mean, that zinc oxide is what you think on the lifeguards yeah, the white. white stuff um, um, we're not telling you to look like uh, a mine when you go out to the beach and just paint yourself white <laughs> i felt i felt like a mine with, with that case that natural. we bought yeah yeah i wish we would have brought that so we could but have. basically they're saying you can't you can't break it down fine enough you have to have some sort of chemical process to do that but choose this sunscreen that has the least amount of additives the least amount but my of chemical th my thing would be you know we need 15 to 20 minutes, right, of direct exposure. Um, cover up after that, just take sun breaks. You can probably do that multiple times a day, right? It's that direct contact because you, your body's going to catalyze these reactions and use all that to form vitamin D, run off and, you know, make these good uh, sterile formations. And then, you know, a couple hours later, or like I said, cover up if you know you're going to be out there beyond that, you know. Um, there's a lot of full spectrum clothing now that blocks all these, you know, uh, VA rays, so use that stuff when you need it, and that's pretty much non-toxic to your skin as far as we know right now. Right now. Um, also, we know we need direct exposure with our eyes. I'm not telling you to go stare into the sun. I know sun gazing became a thing about 10 years ago. I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm also not telling you to wear sunglasses all day. I know a lot of people, we live in Alabama. It's saying, what are the things that go around your neck where your oh, sunglasses shoot. can never leave your, your head? Yeah. They become a necklace. No. It's like the Alabama necklace yeah. for guys. Um, I, I was making fun of a guy. He was wearing. I want to call him like, like crockies, but that's not it. Or something, right? But he was wearing them in church. Like it's like his necklace is his sunglasses. Like they never leave his head. If he goes outside, it's like it's, it's like they fly. Like they just fly onto his face out of nowhere automatically. That's not great. You need exposure again. Growth hormones, serotonin release, sets you up for better sleep later in the day. Um, got anything besides that? Um, here's why I wear sunglasses is so I don't do this. I don't squint because when I squint, I feel like I'm going to create these wrinkles. But then I started using this Bow Beard's Baby Face Oil, and I'm not going to have those wrinkles any longer. This podcast is brought to you by <laughs> Bow Beard's Baby Face Oil. Um, we're 
actually, uh, we took some pictures of my mom using this oil, which I will tell you, if you do have sunburn, it's great. It's so nice. Yeah. It's got a little soothing. Oh, 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 oh. I feel like Tim Allen off Santa Claus right there. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, but oh, 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 oil, um, aloe vera, it's got a lot of good stuff. All the stuff in there that I put in there is research based on basically increasing uh, collagen resiliency, uh, basically giving your body or your skin all the nutrients you need to replicate. Uh, and good for wrinkles. <laughs> my mom's yelling it's good for wrinkles. We put her on half her face when she took pictures. She's like, oh my god. So we're going to try to get her on a QVC with this. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but I think we have went through pretty much. Yeah, was this your Sun. second two-hour podcast? Uh, quite good. I can't. I, I want to I wanna complete this so that I can get into the sun. That's right. Yeah, we need to go back in the pool check the stuff out but i appreciate you guys listening we've got some really really good podcasts coming up not that this one wasn't great anything the beards always fantastic i won't be joining you for the next few but they will be a stellar lineup but if you guys have questions about anything sun exposure based the beards <laughs> you know who that is by now um <laughs> Please uh, drop in the comments. And like I said, maybe we'll try to get uh, a local dermatologist, maybe some sort of sun expert um, on the podcast here pretty soon to give us more of the, the science and clinical background on some of the stuff we were talking about today. Anything else, Lauren? No, that is it. See you guys. That's perfect. So how long was that? 55 minutes.